I don't know if I like another guy telling that, you that my wife is hot. <laughs> so we'll meet outside after. <laughs> I may not have been able to make it to the NBA, but I can make it in MMA. You know what I'm saying? I'm just <laughs> Uh, well, he is right. My wife's name is Kelly, and she is hot and loves Jesus, and that's the best combination. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. If you, if you got, well, pick one or the other, it's love Jesus, but when they love Jesus, they're just hot. It's just, but, but man, if you saw her, you'd be like, how did that happen? Like, how did she say yes to you? I'm rich. I'm just joking. I'm not. <laughs> and we got two great boys, uh, and my eight-year-old is Tyler. He's, uh, no joke, he's eight. And he is about five feet tall. I know. And last time I sit there, you're vertically challenged going, how does that work? I don't know. All I know is I have to feed him. And I have no money left because of it. And then Dylan is our six-year-old. And he's catching up. He's taller at six than Tyler was, which is freaking me out. So I had to work out a little bit more. Because when they get older and they're in high school, they can think they can take dad. Oh, no, 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 no. Old man strength will come back to haunt them. So it's great to meet you guys this morning. Uh, for the next couple hours, I'm just kidding. For the next 40-ish minutes, for maybe a little less, uh, I was asked to share my story. Uh, but the only thing is my story is really pointless in listening to if it's not interweaved with God's story. Because um, I, I was watching some of these videos when you guys were walking in, you guys were talking, but I was trying to hear what they were saying. And it's kind of like, you ever met those people that had that testimony before Jesus who were just like, oh my gosh. It's kind of like they've come up, well, I used to be in a gang and I, I shot my mom and I shot my dad and I shot everyone around me and I did drugs. But I started when I was like two and then I just kept going. And then I was put in prison when I was four. And then when there I became the gang leader of the whole prison. And, and then when I was eight, I was released because I snuck out underground and came out and took a police car and took over a joyride across the country. And that, that was when I was 10. And I mean, you just listen to that whole story. And then they say, and then I came to Christ and I'm the most kind person ever and I just cry over everything. I don't have that testimony. My testimony is this. I was brought up in a Christian home. I was born to Christian parents, brought up in a Christian home, went to Christian school. Who are the Christian school brats in the house? Yeah. Yeah, you remember what it's like? You just open up the, you open up the Bible because you needed a better GPA. Right? You had Bible classes. I better study this thing. I got to know Habakkuk. The only time I'm going to read this is in Christian school. So you got the GPA. Jesus was a subject to study. The Bible was a textbook. I didn't love Jesus. I just needed to get the grade. And I remember I went through elementary school. I went through junior high school. I went through high school. All my life has been Christian schooling. But something happened around my senior year. What well, actually started my sophomore year is there was this girl I really liked. And she went to this youth group. Which I'm not going to lie, God will use anything and anyone to bring people to Jesus. And so I was like, well, she said, hey, do you want to come to youth group? Like, yeah, I do. Because in my mind, I thought, she wants to marry me. Because, so, <laughs> guys, I wasn't the Rico Suave one that you see before you now. I'm just kidding. I, I wasn't good with the girls. I didn't know how to talk to them or they'd actually want to talk to me later. But someone asked me, they're like, absolutely. And I showed up to their church and it was like a youth group of four which is okay because I didn't care about the other two. I just wanted to talk to the one. And then, so I, then all of a sudden I started going to that youth group and absolutely loved it. Fell in love, just loved hanging out with the youth pastor, loved the church. In fact, I started going to the church more than she was. It's almost like it didn't really matter anymore. And then something happened my senior year, or the summer before my senior year, where I remember making this decision at a camp up north. And I said, Jesus, I'm all in. Like, whatever you want. Nobody makes a movie on that story. They're like, oh, tell us that story again. So you didn't really do anything horrible. You brought him Christian home, Christian school, came to Christ like a senior year. Oh, yeah, we can make a documentary on that one. <laughs> the multitudes will come out and see that. And here's the thing. I can say, well, I was a pretty good kid. Here's the truth of the gospel, friends. There's no such thing as good people and bad people. There's only such thing as bad people in Jesus. Friends, to... to to go the opposite direction of what my testimony is without Jesus, the end result is still the same as me without Jesus. I don't have that crazy testimony. But you know what I struggle with today? Because I see all these things. My story is, and you, and you put your little, your little word there. Here's this. My story is about I'm not alone. Fantastic. What's yours? Stretch it out. Escaping lies, finding acceptance. Yours is forgiveness. Here's what I get. Here's my story that God is still rescuing me from. Insecurity. And legalism. I'm a recovering legalist. Like I walk, it's like legalist anonymous. Here I am. 
Hi, my name is Brian. I was a legalist. I had God figured out. You know the worst place to be as a Christian is when you have God figured out. When you actually think you know every answer that's in this book. Think about it. When I sit there and go, God, I got you. There's nothing about you that amazes me anymore. There's a problem with me, not with him. Because think about it. Do you really, think about it. Do you really want a God that you completely understand? When people go, I can't worship a God I don't understand. I don't want to worship a God that I can understand. Friends, when SATs were out of 600, here was my score. I'm just going to give it up, okay? You'll probably want to leave after this, okay? So out of 1,600, 880. I think you get 200 points just to put your name on the thing. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I'm on my way. Yeah! So after 200 points to put my name on it, I scored 600 more points. I'm like, I'm a doofus. But guys, I go, I got this sense of humor. I know how to use the weird ones or the not quote unquote qualified. And here's the joy. It's been wonderful. The whole book, the whole Bible is filled with God using the quote unquote unqualified. But it's filled with God choosing the unqualified. How many remember elementary school, if you were on a campus? If you were homeschooled, this might be a little hard. I don't think you picked teams when you were at home. But if you're on campus, do you want to play kickball growing up? Kickball? That's like the game, man. We should play. I don't, does crew do that? You should have like a kickball tournament. All, the whole school would come out for that. Because everyone loves kickball. Because, hey, how do you want it? Slow baby bouncies. Did you do that? You know what I'm talking about? See, it's universal. I'm 28. I'm just joking. I'm 38. But I'm, hey, I'm 38. And at, when I was in elementary school, we called it out. Hey, medium rollies. And they bounce it all. Like, you throw them back. I said medium rollies. <laughs> rollies. I get it. How hard is it? But that's, it's that whole horrible experience where you stand on the line and two captains are picked. And you don't want to be captain, but you don't want to be last. So it's kind of like, okay, if I think I'm going to be last, I'll be captain. So then you stand there and you wait. Now, guys, I was like a second rounder most of the time. I rarely picked first, second, third round. Not much after that. I don't know why. Honestly, because if you look at my legs, they're long. And for kickball, they look awesome. So here's the thing. You pick second or third, then you feel bad. As it keeps going, you're standing there, you look with your friends, you're like, at least I wasn't last. And then you look at who's last. It's like, there's Jojo. It's like, well, I'll take Jojo. And the only reason they took you is because the other dude has no legs, and that's not good for kickball, so <laughs> that doesn't work at all. So it's like, okay, well, that doesn't work. So you just kind of left over? It's the leftovers. And guys, how often in my life, and I still struggle with this, sometimes I feel like I was just the leftover pick for God. Like he's just putting up with me. I wish I could say that I'm out of that, but that's where I still am. Because I know that God loves me. The Bible tells me that God loves me because God is love. And if God ceases to love, then he ceases to exist. And that would suck. But does he like me? Does he take pleasure in me? Here's the question. Show of hands, how many of you believe God loves you? Just loves you. Okay. okay. Look, you guys raise your hands well. <laughs> Not like this halfway Baptist stuff, like way up charismatic. That's good. <laughs> now here's the thing, same way, real high. How many of you are convinced that God likes you? Now look around, because here's the danger. Almost every hand was up when asked about love. And half the room kept their hands down, because I'm not quite sure, right? You're not quite sure, because I know what I did today, or I know what I did yesterday. Man, I did that yesterday. There's no way God likes me that day. No, no, no. I drove here, lost my patience. You ever pray for patience and then drive? <laughs> you ever do that? Because when you pray for patience, God takes it seriously. He's like, he, was, he just prayed for patience and all the angels in heaven going, why would he do that? <laughs> and then God's like, watch this. This is going to be so fun. And then you get cut off. And then it's like that maybe you kind of cut them off and you shouldn't have and they tell you you're number one and then you just keep driving. <laughs> and then you have that Christian fish on the back of your car and you're like, I, I should take that off. <laughs> I know what I did yesterday and I know how I frustrate myself. 
And I think that's a biblical concept. Romans chapter 7, the second half, you ever, if you've ever read it, Paul's saying, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I hate to do, those are the things I keep doing. I want to do the things that please God, but I find myself doing the things, I find myself doing sin. But I want to please God, but I have all these struggles. You ever been there? Because if you say no, then you might not have Jesus. Because once Jesus came in my life, the Holy Spirit enters me, and I'm now convicted of sin, but he's leading and guiding, and I'm experiencing this love of God. So if you're feeling this tug where you want to please God, but you have this other side that likes that little sinful stuff, that's the Christian life. Welcome to it. You feel like you're losing your mind. I look forward to the day when I live in the firm reality that I'm loved and liked by the creator of the universe, period. And this is the passage that blew my mind. Ready? Hang with me. And there's going to be a word here, okay? Okay, if you weren't around the church, <laughs> Christians are weird. We're a little weird, right? We start fighting with each other over things that don't matter. We start getting all mad. It's like, oh, how dare you? How do you pray? You pray wrong. And then we start, you baptize which way? Oh, my gosh. We start freaking about stuff that doesn't matter. But Christians, you're going to hear this word in here, predestined, and that's when it starts. Oh, he just said it. He said it. No, there's such good stuff here, friends. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. You know what that means? Remember kickball? Go back to that. No leftovers. Here's, he chose me. I'll just do it personally. Okay? And if it fits, if the shoe fits, fit, or if the shoe fits, wear it. Whatever I said. If the shoe fits, wear it. Before he said, let there be light, he looked at me before I was even created and said, let Brian be mine. He chose me before I could do good or bad. Before I actually was born, God somehow knew me and chose me to be in a relationship with Him. It all started with Him. God doesn't need me, but He wants me. His favor was on me before I could do good or bad. Before He said, let there be light, He chose me for His team. And Christians, if you're here today, the same applies. And you say, well, I'm not a Christian. You're here. Guess what? The God of the universe is wooing you into a relationship because before the, before the world began, his favor was already on you. He adores us. You say, well, which one of us? All of us for God so loved the world that he what? He gave up his boy. He gave up his son to do what? To die on a cross, to experience the wrath of a God for the forgiveness of sin. God punished sin and he did it on his son so that he could have a relationship with us. There is nothing that sounds more crazy than that. I got two boys and I adore them. There is absolutely no way. You say, are you sure? I guarantee this. If the only way that I could talk to you and have some type of relationship with you was to sacrifice my son, it would never happen. Like, I'm out of here. I'm not listening to this guy. <laughs> it would never happen. But here comes God. And I forget, he doesn't need us. There's nothing in God where he sits and says, I need Brian. I need him. I need him. Please, please, Brian. He's never once texted me for advice. <laughs> never, never asked me for advice. Brian, I got this really tough one over here. What would you do? About time you called. <laughs> I got it all listed right here. I've been a youth pastor a long time. Surprised it took this long. He doesn't need me, friend. He doesn't need us. So they go, well, I feel fantastic. No, there's a difference. He may not need us, but he wants us. Before the foundation of the world, before he said, let there be light, he chose you. He chose you to be what? Holy and blameless. 
to be holy and before anything began. You say, well, how can that make sense? And that's where your brain should be almost exploding. Like by the time you get to your next class, you won't even know your name. You just walk in. Oh, uh, do you have an answer? I don't even know who I am. I just know that God loves me. Do you know who I am? It should just get you to sit and go, wait, so before everything created, before I could do good or bad, his favor was already on me? Absolutely. And here's the thing. His favor is still on me today, whether I do good or bad. If I do bad, he will direct and he will discipline and he will love and guide me in a direction that is pleasing to him. But his favor doesn't change. His love is constant. It is steadfast. It's reliable. It is real. It is what real love is. Because if I were to ask you, define love. Most of the time, if I ask somebody, hey, what is love? It's like, well, I just love, I love this. I just love this person. Brian, you don't understand. I love them. I say, well, we'll define it. Oh, how do I define it? And then the little poet comes out. <laughs> a Hallmark card. You start with, oh, it's like a river that flows. Because <laughs> we love our... Well, okay, I'll say, I love my wife, and I love my kids, and I love my job, and I love my car, and I love my, I love pizza, and I love, I love all this stuff. So which one wins? We have one word. How do you define it? You remember when you were, you know, when you were younger and in love? Don't get me wrong. Do I believe in in love feelings? Here, I don't believe in the concept of in love. I don't get that. It's like love is just floating around like a bubble. And all of a sudden, you're just walking along, and all of a sudden, it's just, you're in it. It's like, it catches you, oh, and you're floating. I'm in love. <laughs> <sighs> and like the first person you see is like, I've always liked her. So you're trying to bring the bubble closer to her. Because of the bubble, in the bubble, she's in it. Oh, we're in love. <laughs> the problem is, what happens when the bubble breaks? Because we say, oh, we just fell out of love. It just didn't work. And no point does Scripture ever say, oh, it's just this. Trust your feelings. Trust your emotions. You ever realize how unreliable those are? You could wake up so happy one day and then someone else around here, you'll wake up. Some of you guys, every time you wake up, you are just happy. It's like the music starts. Well, however you wake up, some little noise. You're like, I'm alive. <laughs> and you wake up like it's a musical every day. Others of you, you wake up to the Death Star sound. Understand, friends, that's why you're ticked off all day. This is what you wake up to. Uh, 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 on your phone. So what do you do? Hit snooze. Because the next time will be better. <laughs> and it does the same thing. It doesn't say, welcome, can I make you breakfast? It never says that. You're on your own. So I could wake up, be totally great, and have one thing go wrong, and I am shot. In a matter of an instant, do you realize that our feelings are fleeting? God says, I want to give something that's constant. You say, well, Brian, what, how would you define love? Putting the other person first, whatever the cost, without expecting anything in return. That's it. It's all about others. I love that, you, I love that this whole campaign is, we love Jesus and we love you. We love Jesus and we love you. Because guess what? That's the whole Bible summed up right there. You love God first and foremost. You love others, and that's it. That's what it's about. But loving others doesn't mean, oh, I just do, do whatever you want. I don't, I'm not going to judge you. Can you imagine me parenting like that? Tyler, you want to play in the street? You're excited about that? Let me, okay, let's go to the freeway. Because there's a bigger street with more cars. If my boy says, Dad, can I play in the street? Well, I don't want to judge you, so... I guess. I don't want to get in your way. I want to love you. If that's, what, if that's your hobby, then I want to support you. Go! Get him! Play like Frogger. Go for it! <laughs> Is that love? The Bible says this. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You sit there go, hmm, that's good. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> I just heard the word kisses and I was off on that one. <laughs> Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Some of you guys have had friends and maybe lost friends because they actually confronted you. Now, some have done it really badly, and that's probably why you're not friends anymore. But if, if you ever had a friend that told you why what you're doing is wrong and you gave up that friend, you, made, you might have given up the greatest asset that Jesus has ever given you, this side of heaven. 
And some of you keep surrounding yourselves with all these people that they just keep telling you why things are great, why you're so fantastic. You ever notice how we decide what right and wrong is? We go to people and we say something like this. Hey, I did this last night. What do you think? Don't judge me. She walked to group number two. This is what I did last night. Don't judge me. You go to three. This is what I did last night. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what I'm talking about. You're my best friend. And then we walk off. Do you realize that there's a God in heaven? Do you realize that all these, all these standards and these principles and these things don't do, do, don't do, do, these things that are in Scripture, do you know why he gave them? For our joy. Guys, when we can get that, when I can look in this book and realize every time I open this that the God of the universe is speaking to me, and he's guiding and he's leading and he's telling me what to do and what not to do because he actually, he actually wants to bless. He actually has his joy in mind for my life. If when my kids were young and they started crawling toward the light socket with a knife, do you think I should stop them? No, let them go. They got to learn. So they just say, well, I bet you won't do that again. But if I stop them and I pull them away, is that loving? If my kid somehow walks out off the, off, off the curb and is about to get hit by a car and I land on him, I tackle him to roll him out of the way and I land on him 250 pounds on my little boy and roll him out of the way and break an arm, not his, not mine, but his, would I be loving? You don't know. Yeah. Would you judge me? How dare you? How dare you break his arm? How dare you stop him from getting hit by that bus? That hurt him. But I hurt him, why? Because I wanted him to live. And friends, maybe some of you guys are getting kind of hurt a little bit. It's called discipline. Why would he do it? Why would God do it? Because he loves you. He's a great parent. When I mention God as Father, maybe some of you in the room go, I can't go there. Either I don't know my father or I can't stand my father or my father did this to me and I am so sorry and the heart of the eternal father breaks over that and I can tell you he is the ultimate father you realize you can't get rid of him I've surrendered my life to Jesus and I can't get rid of him He's on me all the time. How do I know? Because before the foundation of the world, he chose me for this. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. That word will can also be translated his desire. Friends, we have made Jesus look so boring. And think about it. I mean, we gave him long hair just so he looks cool. All the movies is like the perfect flowing he's really he's usually really tall and white and the perfect beard i don't understand that like how do you get that beard first century israel i don't understand it there's no kind of oh i'm god i made it <laughs> but he's like six three i, I don't meet a maybe, I, don't, I just don't feel like i meet a lot of six foot three six foot five jewish people they seem a little shorter <laughs> now there may be it just doesn't seem the norm See, Jesus wasn't this big, huge, tall, white surfer guy. But we've made him emotionless. I mean, picture, picture the Jesus movies. There's Jesus preaching to a crowd. Think about it. The multitudes come because they love to hear him preach. And this is how he preaches. Blessed are the poor. I'm like, where did that fake English accent come from? <laughs> You're in Israel. And it's like, blessed are the poor. It's almost like a boring version of Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Who loves Mr. Rogers? I love Mr. Rogers. Who, if anyone doesn't like Mr. Rogers, they should be shot. <laughs> Everyone loves Mr. Rogers. Would you ever crucify Mr. Rogers? No. So why is it we've turned Jesus into someone who's a little bit less interesting than him? See, Jesus was a revolutionary. And Jesus preached with power. In fact, people were amazed. They'd be they're looking and going, do you hear what? Man, we don't, none of these other preachers preach like that. Man, they're all horrible compared to this guy. And do you know who he hung out with? 
the worst of the worst, quote unquote. Those sinners. The sinners. Well, what kind? I mean, is it like, it's like grades? Which one was it? Can you imagine just showing it to a party? You're kind of the guest of honor and you're surrounded by a bunch of tax collectors. You're like, well, those aren't that bad. But in that day, you are the worst. You are, you, are, um, you are worse than worse. You are almost close. You are so close to death, it's not even fun. Tax collectors, the worst of the worst, prostitutes hanging around. I don't think that they watched their mouth. I don't think that they had like clean jokes. I don't think Jesus walked, what did you say? Don't you dare say that naughty word. I'll kill you right now. I'll just zap you done. I don't think that's what happened. Isn't it weird? The quote unquote sinners, the worst of the worst, they flocked to Jesus and quote unquote the worst of the worst of sinners of today run from his followers. What's the problem, friends? Is it because we actually found Jesus? Friends, we've never, we never, you never found Jesus. That one, day, that one day at camp, I found Jesus. No, he's never been lost. He chose you before the foundation of the world. See, what that does is it keeps me humble going, okay, I had nothing to offer him before his love was for me. I couldn't tell him of why I was so great. And here's my resume and all the things that I've accomplished. I was nothing. And I've screwed up since I was born. And I'll probably mess up along the way. But his favor, his love for me is because of his character. How do I know that God adores you? It's the cross. It's the cross. cross and the thing is that we wear that don't we how many of you guys have a, a charm of a cross anybody maybe you don't have it now but you at least have one or had one in the past we sit there and go it's, it's so fantastic it's the it's the mark of the love and grace and mercy of god who has an electric chair charm anybody anybody, anybody? no why not form of execution First century Jewish person, when Jesus says, you want to be my follower, deny yourself, pick up your cross. They're like, they're not thinking love, mercy, grace of God. They're thinking form of execution. You want, to, you want proof that God loves you? It's the cross every time. You say, well, this happened in my life. This happened, this, this, all these bad things happened. But there's the cross every time. We live in a broken world. You want proof? Watch the news. The news has got to be one of the most de- depressing things you could ever watch. I don't walk around going, why, wow, I really have a lot of information that I feel like I could benefit the world with. I just want to curl up under a blanket and pretend like it doesn't exist. Do we live in a broken world? We're broken. Who? If you're broken, put your hand up. Christian or non-Christian, who's broken? So here's, let me just encourage you. You suck. <laughs> yeah! Just walk, maybe that's your next shirt. I suck. Woo! Because guess what? The facade's over. We're broken. And the only way something is broken is to be put back together to put, or to be healed. And the only healer that I know that's actually real is Jesus. We'll say, Brian, that's your opinion. Fine. Fair enough. But it sure seemed to have worked. It's worked. I told you I grew up kind of legalist. And it's weird. My parents weren't legalists. In fact, I'm, I'm the one that brought my parents to go to church after a while. I mean, they had Christian morals and standards. But then after Grandma died, I didn't really go to church anymore. My dad didn't go to church hardly ever. He worked on Sundays. So I remember when I was a sophomore in high school up through when I was a senior. I remember wanting them to come but not sure how to get them there. And I remember the one day they walked in. I was like, oh. My friends are like, oh, your parents are here. I'm like, well, duh. I know them better than you. Shut it. I didn't know what to do. They didn't lead me into legalism. I don't know what got me there. It's that whole religious side. And I was even a youth pastor for a while in that life. I was one of those mean, nasty, angry Christians. When I'm preaching, I'm like that ticked off football coach. It's in your face. Grab your face. and I'm just screaming. I would tell kids, hey, you got to be reading the Word. And some kid would come around, Brian, I read the Bible like three days this week. You know what my first response every time was? Why not four? Why not four? I read it six days. Why not seven? Brian, I read it seven days this week. Why not eight? <laughs> well, let's shut up. I know what I said. It was never good enough. And you know what I portrayed to them? A God that was never satisfied. 
You know what freed me? Or what broke it and is now working me through the process of being freed? Accepting the fact that I suck. And God knows I'm broken. And his favor was on me before the foundation of the world. So whatever your past was, or maybe you're in that part, that part of the testimony that's like, so you're not quite over to Jesus yet. Do you understand that God's love is still on you? It was on you before the foundation of the world. And no one and nothing on this planet will love you like God does. Now, if you're a Christian in the room, and I'm saying this part, and this is when you start tuning out because I've already heard that. There's a problem with you. The love of God for us should never become boring. It should never, the gospel should never be boring. John 3.16 should never be something that I recite, but something that blows my mind. I remember being in third grade and sitting in a little Christian school chapel. Remember, chapel? remember Christian school, Brad? You sit in the chapel once a week. You never brought your Bibles. People say, hey, do you have your Bibles? You're like, nope, don't need it. It's not, not getting graded. Who cares? So you sit in chapel, and this guy comes in. He goes, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like to talk to you today on this verse that I'm sure maybe you've heard it. John 3.16. Did he just say John 3.16? We know that one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, okay, go ahead. And you almost want to start a revolt. It's like, we know that one. I'm not going to listen. You pull a sword and paint your face blue. I'm not going to listen. Freedom from chapel. I mean, just like, you want to be gone. It's about 30 years ago. I've never forgotten what he said. It is stuck in me. He goes, I'm going to sum up that verse in five words. It's like God looks at you and says, I will never leave. And in third grade, I'm like, oh, okay. I'm 38. And I still remember it. And friends, I still preach it. I can't tell you how often I've gone around somewhere and just looked and said, you know what that verse means? God will never leave you. Friends, when the gospel becomes ordinary, there's nothing wrong with the story. There's something wrong with the hearers of the story. God's love for us is as big as he is, and his pleasure in us is just as big. Do you realize that at the proper time God saved you? It brought him pleasure. In other words, it made him happy. Do you know why Jesus took the cross? It was the only way that he could have us. In John chapter 17, it's the only time when I see Jesus say, this is what I want. Every other time he's talking to the Father, Father, your will be done. Your will, whatever you want. I'm by your will. Your will, your will. But in here he says, this is the thing that I want. I want those that you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see me in all of my glory. I want them. So we could apply it and say, Jesus said, I want them. I want them who are in crew. In 2013 at Cal Poly, I want them, and I want those who are on that campus, and I want those in this community, I want them. And the only way was the cross. So he endured the cross, scorning his shame. Why? For the joy set before him. Did I make it up? Hebrews tells us, Hebrews chapter 12, it was the joy set before Jesus that he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then seated at the right hand of the Father. Why would he do it? What is the joy? The joy is us. That's the joy. He adores you. There is not one moment where he has ever, ever regretted coming for us. He loves you. He likes you. You bring him pleasure. You make him excited. You can astonish God. Do you understand that? Jesus, who knew everything, would look at a man, who, the centurion who had this faith. Then he actually looked and said, I've never seen faith like this, not even in Israel. It says that it astonished Jesus, that you can surprise Jesus even though he knows it's coming. 
It's this relationship with God where when I first started in ministry and when I first started walking with Jesus, it wasn't about Jesus, it was about Christianity. It was about being a pastor. It was about having half of an office, which made me feel like a grown-up. It was about me having all the answers and getting to teach this book because I knew what it meant. And if Jesus showed up, it didn't matter. Heaven, give me the stuff. Jesus doesn't even have to show up. Today, Give me one room with a table and a light hanging from the ceiling and give me Jesus and take the rest away because it's turned into a love affair with the Creator because that's what He's offered to us. He's offered us Himself. And that's what we were created for. So if you're here without Jesus... Be as objective as you can. You can say, I totally disagree with you. That's okay, but be objective. When you fall asleep at night, and that one thing, if you just had that one thing that, being, that would bring true fulfillment in your life, what would it be? And you start listening off. Oh, I found, found that spouse. That perfect house, perfect car, perfect, you know, perfect neighborhood I get to live in, perfect job, perfect. But all those things, all of a sudden, they get... They're, they're not totally fulfilling. So you keep adding on. So maybe right now it's different things. You keep adding on, adding on, adding on, adding on. If the creator created you for a purpose to have a relationship with himself, you will always go seeking after something until you go to Jesus who you were created for. You were created to have a love affair with the God of the universe. You say, well, about all these rules and all these things... The rules are summed up, love God and love others. And as you get into scripture, you sit there and go, I don't know, I agree with this part. But because I love God and because I trust him and know him, I can submit to these things. But it starts with his love for you. It's much easier to be a Christian when you're five. Because you know how it just made sense when you're five? God didn't make sense. He didn't even care. You just knew what? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And that's good enough. I've never once heard five-year-olds debating that. I've never heard a five-year-old say, Jesus loves me. This I know. How do you know? (laughs) The Bible tells me so. How do you know it's true? I've never heard that part. All I've ever heard is a response when I hear Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. You know what the response after that? That's it. Yes, Jesus loves me. I'm not going to sing it. (laughs) No, God's blessed me with something. That might not be it. And then uh, you know know what's after that? Once they do that little part of the end, you know what they say? You want to play kickball? (laughs) They're not debating it. They're not worried about it. They're not freaking out about it. To them, it's totally fine. Jesus loves me. If I walked into my boy's room tonight, I said, boys, I just want to ask you, do you know that Jesus loves you? They would say yes, without a doubt. Yeah? Do they totally get it? Nope. At 38, do I totally get it? Nope. Blows my mind that before Jesus said, let there be light, he said, let him be mine. His love and favor was on you before the creation of the world. There is no one on this planet who has ever loved you like Jesus, and there never will be. Jesus loves you. What an elementary, yet absolutely mind-blowing concept. The God of the universe adores you. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I need this. Well, legalist likes to wake up in me every once in a while. I thank you that this message slaps them right back down. God, for those who are here that adore you, God, increase that love for you. Reveal yourself more and more to them so they love you more. And as they love you more, reveal more and just keep it going. And for those who are here and they were just invited and maybe they were tricked, they just said free pizza and didn't know they'd hear about Jesus the whole time. Holy Spirit, woo them and share with them that before the foundation of the world, you chose them to be here. Woo them, Holy Spirit, into a relationship with you, which is what they were created for. Father, forgive us for the times that we judge. I do believe that you've called us as Christians to judge each other.
called accountability. But you told us to share the love of Jesus with those who don't know you, and that's all. May we be faithful to the call as we're faithful to you. God, to you be all the praise, all the glory and all the honor, for you alone are worthy. And we pray this in Jesus' name, whenever everyone who agrees says, amen. God bless you.